Thank you, thank you. And welcome to the event space. All right, uh, I'm gonna start, uh, and that's me, looking like a bad actor, everyone tells me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the senior creative producer of the podcast, uh, but we're pretty much a team, uh, and we work together, which I think is at the, at the heart of our success. Uh, and I'm gonna bounce through these slides, starting with this one. And I'll leave it up there for a couple minutes, because that's the room we started in. Um, as you can see, it's pretty tiny, and we had to squeeze around that table with mics and everything, and uh, I think part of uh, everything we do is based on the flexibility that we need to have, uh, particularly and, and still, to find space. But um, the key, well, let me ask first, has anyone heard the podcast? Does anyone listen to the podcast? Okay, is anybody here? That many, wow. <laughs> oh my, everybody in the room, unbelievable. Not all at once now. Um, and is anybody here who's kind of interested in starting their own podcast? Maybe that might be another question. Okay, so we, we kind of, I'm going to give a, a little history of the show and then we'll also give you guys some tips on, on what you can do to start your own show. But um, we talk about photography, obviously, and um, the key, I always think that the format is small, so the freedom is big. Uh, we have, a, you know, this is, applies whether you're working out of your basement or whether you're working under the umbrella of a big company, um, which is what we are doing. And they each have their set of problems and, and obviously uh, you got to deal with them. Um, especially in a company like this, which is not always so sure what to do with content. But we're, 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 we're going forward. And, and remember that we're a branded content. So we don't have to worry about getting advertising. We don't have to worry about necessarily, you know, paying our salary with the work we do, which, uh, which is a benefit in some ways. We can, we can advance that way. Um, but if you want to start a show on your own subject, it seems obvious that you should talk about something you love. Um, if you're not an expert, at least have an interesting take or a great personality. I suggest listening to the podcasts that are out there uh, that, that are similar to what you'd like to do. Find a niche that need to be filled. And um, of course, if you want to make money at it, find a set of organizations that would like to affiliate with you. And if money is not a concern, you just can go forward, build up a listenership and you know, quality and consistent, consistent programming will do that, which I think is the case with us. Um, Although we were kind of given this as an assignment to do. I was given this as an assignment to do about, uh, about two years ago, and we're going to go into that now. Uh, so in April 2015, uh, we were, myself and another colleague who's not here right now, was, uh, was asked to start a podcast, and we really didn't know too much about what we were doing, but uh, we were told to out-geek everybody on the Internet. Um, and I said, well, we're not really geeks, so I don't know how we're going to do that. So they said, well, how about doing the water cooler talk, you know, what people talk about at B&H and, and just put that on the air. So that was kind of what was at the beginning of, of you know, the, the, the seed of this. Um, and frankly, pretty quickly, it didn't seem like it was working out too well. Um, so with, with the colleague that I had at the time, we, we, we did something that was along the lines of car talk. I don't know if people are familiar with car talk, but it's a pretty well-known NPR show where two brothers talked about cars and they just injected their personality and I think they're at the heart of a lot of what, what is that podcasting now. So we kept going, uh, we did our pilots, we actually did pilots for about six months before anything came on the air. We tested things, we tried things, we tried formats, we tried segments and things like that and um, at the end of the day uh, conversations <coughs> about photography was what we really wanted to do, just as, as simple as that. Um, I have two NPR up there is because eventually um, we were told that we were too much like NPR <laughs> and, uh, and we needed to change our format. But coming up to that in a minute. Uh, what I wanted to do, though, was use B&H and particularly the New York City resources that we have here uh, to, to provide the best conversations possible. And I found that was different from a lot of things that were out there. A lot of other podcasts talk about gear, their opinions, and news about cameras and photography. But I felt having New York City right here and also B&H, you know, which, which can draw a lot of water. Uh, we can get people to come and talk to on our show, which, which proved to be true. And we also have a great staff of experts. And if we needed to call them in, we did. And, uh, and we've, we've continued to do both of those things. Um, also, we, we also have an, a blog. The B&H blog is called Explora. I don't know if any of you guys read it, but you should. There's some wonderful writers who, who will give you all the information you need to know about photo, audio, video, and everything that B&H covers. Um, but we wanted to kind of cater to that audience, but also expand the audience. Uh, I felt that... Uh, there's a lot of stuff about photography that we weren't talking about. 
And if as, I could just jump in for a sec, I think one of the advantages of the blog is, especially if we're talking about gear or any topic, uh, it could be travel or documentary, is that when we write, and all of us write for Explorer, um, we have certain limitations. Uh, it could be anywhere from 1,500 to a couple of thousand words. We're in a podcast situation, it's very fluid, and you can go to places you just can't get to on a written page. So it gives us a little bit more room to play. Yeah. That's important. Yeah, and in terms of topics also, I mean, yeah. and, and you know, many things everywhere, but here particularly, I think, are based on number of clicks and the numbers and, and that kind of, um, kind of uh, numerical feedback, you know. And I think we wanted to go a little bit deeper than, than that. Um, and lastly, you know, getting the best guests possible was always part of what uh, I wanted to do and we wanted to do. So getting back to 2NPR, uh, we had a, uh, you know, one of the CEOs said that you guys aren't doing what we think you should be doing. The podcast is, uh, at least the, the pilots, we had not, hadn't released anything yet, was a little bit boring. So um, my colleague was... Uh, was asked to step aside. They asked me to become the producer of the show and enter Alan Whites to become the host. And obviously that was a pretty good move for, for, for them and for us. And I'll add, I knew nothing about podcasting at that time. Zero, mm-hmm. nothing. And, and has to this day, changed? I'm still not quite sure. <laughs> 80, 80 episodes down the line. But you did, a, you did have on, on camera experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. At that point, I was working for the uh, uh, video uh, uh, group here at b so I was, I was I was used to working in front of a camera and presenting information, but this is a whole different kind of a form. It was totally unscripted, whereas we're doing videos, it's scripted down to the, the word. Here we That's have good. a list of questions that we go, and if we're if John's lucky, I stick to those questions. His job is also to reel me back in because I look at the script. I go, "Great, let's do it." Then I just go. <laughs> so, so <laughs> and in April 2015, we started with with the idea and with pilots. Our first episode went live on well was published on October 21st, 2015. Uh, but that didn't solve our problems at all. We were still still struggling, especially in, in many ways, but finding space to record and edit. Uh, we, we share space with the video team and, and they get priority in the studio. So we were, we were often getting pushed out. And as I showed that earlier, that slide, uh, we were using conference rooms that we could get to edit and to record, which Jason will tell you, you know, offers a lot of uh, problems when it comes to you know, getting clean sound. So uh, some of the things we were dealing with in those early months were, were concerns from management, uh, you know, whether, and, and, you know, concerns we had to deal with, whether we were a branded podcast, which we were, or indie, and how we wanted to take that, you know, if we wanted to just, you know, toe the line uh, or just kind of become ourselves, uh, what value we were bringing to the company, and especially in a company that, that, that looks to numbers and looks to financial value. It was hard for us to say, well, you know, we're, we're making money for you guys because we really weren't. Um, but we thought we were bringing a different kind of value, and that was kind of a conversation. And uh, we would ultimately bring listeners and then hopefully customers. Uh, there's always the issue at BH about if you're publishing something, if it's going to be timely or what they call evergreen, something that you can look at in two years or three years and it would still make sense and still, still be worthwhile, or to do something of the moment. And, and they really shied away from doing things that are of the moment. But we tried to, tried to you know, walk that line of doing a little bit of both. And the issue of gear, because we sell gear. Gear is what people come to, to listen to and to talk about. So are we going to talk only about gear, or are we going to talk about all the other things that photographers talk about, which is what I wanted to do. And of course, gear sometimes. And this is still an issue that we, we, we deal with. And um, uh, we found solutions, I think, to that, though. Uh, the other thing is we wanted to cover themes that were not covered by B&H and uh, a little more maybe deep topics, a little more news related, a little more documentary related. And a couple of the examples of our early shows, uh, we did an episode where we, we profiled a, a, a show at the MoMA, a photography show at the MoMA. We did an episode about the history of uh, Laika, which, uh, Laika, which was a, uh, a little known piece of history where the, the owner of the time had helped... Uh, get Jews and other perse- persecuted people out of Nazi Germany. And we, we focused a little bit on that history. And we did an episode on climate change where photographers, three photographers were dealing with climate change. And, and you know, some of those issues were hard to get through. You know, people didn't really want uh, to talk about that stuff, I could say. But we, you know, we did a couple edits, we had some feedback, and, and then we went forward. Um, and as I said, um, the format is small, so the freedom can be big. And teamwork, I mean, I think the, the, the keys to what we did as we were going forward was that the team kind of gelled and, and we all got along well and we appreciate everybody's input. So 
In March 3rd, 2016, I'm saying we are hitting our stride then. We did an episode called uh, Defining the Iconic Image, which I think was one of our first really, really good episodes. Uh, and um, this is after the fact. Everybody's happy. But uh, <laughs> about, about an hour before this, you can see we were kind of scrambling. We had to use a conference room because we had gotten kicked out of the studio because they had something that took priority. So there we are taping up sound blankets to a wall of a conference room and Jason setting everything up and we're doing what we can to get ready. Um, but, that, but that episode, uh, you know, it was a lot of work to get that thing done. Uh, it took about a year to get the people. We had guests drop out. We finally got two incredible guests. Hal Buell uh, is the older gentleman who was a former uh, head of photography for the AP. And Olivia Laurent is now an editor at Time Magazine. So we had them talk about what they think the most iconic images are, something that had nothing to do with gear or technique. And uh, I think it was a really good episode, and I think it stands up still. And it actually opened the door for a lot of things we were going to do from there. So just to run down on this, this chronology, um, we were still working out of a studio, whether it was a studio or a conference room. But then we went uh, on March 5th, about a, a year after we really started, we did our first remote episode where we took the mics out to a place and, and recorded there and we've done that we still continue to do that we uh we went to the penumbra society to talk foundation penumbra foundation to talk about um uh, alternative processes we went to optic last year and again this year we went to the eddie adams farm for their uh their incredible uh, workshop for photojournalism and recently we went to the the photographer thomas roma's house and did a, an episode out of his house which brings a lot of i think a lot of feeling to the episode when we're doing them in the locations where the people are there and here's a couple images from from those times here we are in a hotel conference a hotel ro uh, conference room uh with chris nicholson and michael kenna on the left and behind that door is a kitchen so we had a lot of people coming in and out of uh <laughs> as we we're trying to record but you know some of the ambient noise helps and here's jason in the barn the converted barn of the eddie adams workshop farm uh you'll uh, notice that that's actually a deserted dental office okay. there's actually <laughs> drills and chairs and x-ray machines in the background there it um, was interesting so we you know <laughs> flexibility again is a key to finding a space and here we are in thomas roma's house where we worked with him and his son uh again just in September of 2016, we did our first Skype episode. And a lot of people ask, well, why can't you do something by Skype? And at first, I was resistant because I liked the feel of having people right there. It breeds a conversation. It breeds a back and forth that I think was valuable. Uh, but Skype brings advantages. I mean, we can reach out to people around the world and talk about subjects that we can't get when we're trying to get people here. Also, you know, flying people in is expensive. We don't have a budget. So, so that, that actually has been a big benefit. Uh, there are some good, there's some bad, you know, audio becomes an issue and the internet connection can break down. So, uh, it's things you have to deal with. Uh, but we've done several Skype episodes now and a couple of them are, some, are very strong. Uh, in January of this year, we did our first gear cast where we focused, we branded the episode, this is Jason's idea, uh, about gear. So once a month we do a specific episode on gear, which kind of frees us up to do other episodes, you know, once we get the gear thing out of the way. And we also added a segment to the beginning of most episodes called Al's Gear, not Geared, Gearhead Pick of the Week, where Alan picks a, a new piece of gear and we talk about it at the beginning of the show. Uh, we also became a sponsor in, in March of 2017 of the Month of Photography Denver, which is our first experiment, getting our, our name out there to the bigger public in, in terms of uh, sponsoring something. And we started recently doing serial episodes where we return to the same photographer talking about a similar subject once a month. And hopefully that will develop an audience uh, going forward. Uh, not too long ago, we, we switched to a new hosting service, which I, I see I think has been a big benefit. And uh, our listeners are growing steadily. You know, we're up to about 20,000 listeners a week. And uh, we're about this tomorrow, no, tonight, we, we put out our 80th episode, which is hard to believe given how this thing started. And uh, probably by the end of the summer, we're going to have 1 million listens in total. So we're pretty happy with the success, and uh, we're going to continue forward as long as they let us. What is next? Uh, we want to experiment with some audio. We want to work on sound design. We are thinking about doing shows where we analyze one photo and talk to the photographer, uh, the whole episode about, about one photo, talking about maybe doing some long-form analysis, some news, and even starting a podcast network where we do another podcast about another subject, perhaps audio or video or something to that effect. All right. Car talk. Or back to talking about cars. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go into a little bit about how we build an episode. I'm, I'm the producer. We, most of the things start uh, 
you know, I always put, you know, te- trust but test your format. I was pretty sure that we had a good format going, but we always test it. We always change. We see what works. And uh, there are many, many photography podcasts out there. So, uh, you know, we wanted to find something that was a little bit different. And I think we have. Um, when we build an episode, the theme to me is a priority and everything flows from that. Uh, some people say, oh, why don't you talk to this photographer about his work or her work? And b and has a lot of that. You know, we don't want to duplicate content of things that are already done. The event space does a wonderful job of, of doing that. So we, we try to pick a theme that has to do with photography and then find different viewpoints of people that can talk about that and, and then bring in, bring in the best guests possible. Uh, another episode we always have to consider now is whether we're going to do it in, in studio, by Skype, or go do a remote episode. And each have their values and each have their complications. Uh, guests. Again, getting a guest is, is key, a good guest, someone that can talk on that subject. So we always, I mean, I kind of learned or decided, I should say, right away that we might as well get the best we can. We're in New York City. There are the best photographers in the world pass through this city. So why not ask for them? You know, if you have a theme about aerial photography or whatever it happens to be, find the best. You know, don't just get somebody who does it. Try to find the best. And if they're not available or not willing, you can work your way down. So that, that's kind of where we start uh, looking for a guest. Um, being under the B and H banner helps. We can get uh, you know attention from people that we wouldn't otherwise get if we were doing this on our own. And um, some guests are now you know are suggested to us. Some will say, "Hey, this person will be great for this," or or you might want to look into them. And and sometimes that that proves to be true. And and we have some wonderful episodes out of that. And now some people are coming to us. They want to be on the show. So that that's a that's a nice uh, feeling when when big photographers or, or not so big come and they want to be on our show. Um, so we're willing to take, you know, guests when they come, but, uh, only if they fit what we're doing, be patient, but be ready to jump. Uh, we've done episodes where I had an idea, uh, about doing a New York city crime scene photographer and talking about that, but to go through the New York city, the police department, you know, the hoops you have to jump through was crazy, but we persisted. And eventually about a year after we first started this, we got a guest and I thought we had a pretty good episode out of that. Uh, but on the flip side, if we have a theme that we know we want to cover and someone makes somebody available and they're ready that week, we're kind of mobile enough and ready that we can jump. And uh, that, that episode called What's Your Going Rate about what photographers charge is an example of that. Uh, here's another, just kind of a shot of when we're running kind of at full speed. Uh, that's Vincent Laferre, a uh, Pulitzer Prize photographer who was made available because he wanted to promote a book. Is one of the few examples where we took a guest just because who he was, you know, and... Uh, He's kind of a big name, and, and this is early it on. It was also a very thought, good episode. And he knows his stuff. Episode, it was a, yeah. it was a yeah. fun episode. But that's our studio, and that's when we're running kind of at full. That's, that's what we look like when we're not having to squeeze into another space. Uh, so building an episode. Uh, we have a theme. We have a guest. We write a script, uh, which is basically just a set of talking points and possible questions, as well as an introduction to the, to the photographers. Uh, and I, I tend to write that. And then I pass it over to Alan, and he'll add his, his aspects to it. And then we'll double check it again before we go to air. And, and on occasion, I actually refer to it during the show. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, intro and outro, we include plugs, if any need to be plugged. Anything needs to be plugged, we're always sure on that. Plugging our own show, getting people to subscribe. And I'm going to take my, my chance here for everybody listening out in, the, in streaming land. And here, please subscribe. Go to iTunes. Subscribe to the B&H Photography Podcast. It doesn't, it's free. You don't have to listen to it, but if you're subscribing, you'll get it in, and it helps us. Uh, and, of course, we plug the photographers in their work. And there's always room for improvisation, improvisation because um, a good conversation is built on that. So what do you do with your guests? Uh, this, is the, um, this is what I kind of consider my role as a producer, <coughs> is what I'm telling you now. We get the guests, and we treat them as well as possible. I mean, we're not paying them to come in. Occasionally, we were able to give them a, a thank you gift card. But in general, they're doing it out of their own time. Sometimes they have things to plug, but other times they don't. So they're really giving us you know, their time for, for, for free and, and their effort and their experience for free. But what, we, what I say, call sheets and coffee, which is basically ask them what they want. Do they want coffee? What can we get for them? Make them happy. Make them comfortable. And I put out a call sheet, which I send to them that gives them an idea of how the show is going to proceed step by step and, uh, and some of the topics we're going to talk about. Some, some of them look at it carefully and they read it and they're very prepared. Others, I'm sure they don't even look at it and they just show up and, and have a chat, which both can be great. Uh, be organized, be respectful, be respectful of their time, uh, of their work. I don't know if they're a big photographer, a small photographer, an editor, a CEO, uh, 
someone who runs an auction house, an NYPD officer, it doesn't matter. Be respectful of their work and especially of their time. We should be punctual, we should be on time, we should be ready, simple things, but uh, important, and be grateful. I mean, the, the number of thank you emails I send out <coughs> is, uh, is incredible, but it's well worth it. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, we do try to give people a, a little thank you gift card when applicable, especially if they're, they're doing something, you know, and they're not getting a, a plug for their own self. Um, here's an example of a call sheet, just to take a look at it. Uh, it's something that I learned when I worked in film. Uh, have all the information, all the times people are supposed to show up, summary of the episode, opening comments, talking points. And, you know, sometimes we need to get points in, and I'm very, very forceful, you know, with Alan and say, hey, make sure this is mentioned. And other times we just wing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we're recording, I sit down on the recording. Uh, I've kind of grown back into the role of a co host to some degree, um, partly because to keep things moving forward because you know if we record for an hour and a half and we have to edit it down to 45 minutes that just makes our work so much harder so trying to keep things on point and, and moving forward is important but for but you have to you know leave room for improvisation and letting a good conversation go where it's going to go i mean that's that's just the way it should be uh let your guests talk don't chew the scenery it's really not about you as much as it is about the guests uh, although we have had some shows where it's just us talking, and, and that's good too, you know, because the and the, we do chew the scenery, and we do chew the scenery, and then uh, listen. That's kind of my key. You have to listen to the people. You may be ready with your next question, but if their answer takes it in a different direction, you have to be prepared to go. So listening is obviously key. Uh, then we get down to the editing because uh, everything is edited. It's not a live stream. It's not. We don't just record it and put it out. Uh, and then there's the basic things that you have to do, removing the coughs and the lip smacks and the ums and the you knows and all the things that kind of break up a conversation uh, like that. <laughs> and the things that we do that we don't even know we're doing when we talk, all the little uh, you know, per personal idiosyncrasies of our speech. Sometimes it's good to cut those out just for the flow. One of the things I learned, and I never knew this, is that I tend to say is it's safe to assume a lot. I say that oh, two or three times per episode, and I did not know that until yeah. I started listening to it, and these guys started teasing me about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. A lot of things we... <laughs> a lot of things. We like that one, that's though. That's what I know that they're talking about. We usually leave that in, though. We yes, like, we, we yeah, like, that you leave in. That's one of your you more endearing <laughs> idiosyncrasies. So for me, one of the main, the crucial aspects of these shows is, is to kind of maintain a narrative. You know, follow, keep the story moving forward and, and find ways from something that's said at the beginning of the episode, find ways to get back to that later so it follows up on that same point. So that each episode is kind of like a little story in its own way. Um, also editing, you gotta maintain the flow and the rhythm of the show uh, so it doesn't bog down. Sometimes we'll cut out a whole section of the show, a whole section of conversation just because it went off on a different topic or uh, it just was boring, you know? Uh, and also we have to mind the time. I mean, sometimes we record for up to two hours, but we have to cut the show down to about an hour, sometimes less. Sometimes a little more. It all depends. And that's the flexibility that podcasting brings you. You don't have to be strictly an hour. You can be a little less. You can be a little bit more. Or anything, you know, any podcast can be very short. It doesn't matter. Then uh, we publish. We publish on our B&H site. And we also use hosting services, which, of course, iTunes is where most people hear the show. But we publish... Uh, a blog post that includes photos of the guest, uh, a blog, uh, you know, a blurb written piece that I take a lot of time to write. I actually find that pretty, uh, pretty important, and I hope people read it. Uh, and when we publish, we have to get photos to use, so we need to get the permission. There's a lot of back and forth with uh, the photographers themselves, so whoever owns the rights to the images. Um, what other art we may need to create, the graphics team that we have at B&H helps with that. We're working with in-house teams like our copy editor and our graphics people to get the stuff up. And you know, there's challenges working within a system that you might not have if you're on your own, you know, obviously. But there's benefits too. And I write the copy. And hyperlinks are currency. Many, many people are on the show just because they want to get their hyperlink into the B&H site, which when we email it out, you know, reaches millions of people. So that's kind of uh, the thing. When we distribute it, uh, this is still an issue. We're trying to find ways to get the podcast out to people because uh, b &H has a great blog, but people go to the b &H website and most people don't even know about this blog, but there's great information. Mm -hmm. There's great articles. Um, one of the ways that we get things out every Saturday, there's every other Saturday, there's an email blast that reaches about 5 million people and uh, we, get, we include the, the podcast in that. Uh, social media, b &H has, you know, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook accounts where they'll 
they'll send it out. Uh, and our list of subscribers, which is basically the key. I mean, as many subscribe, the more subscribers we have, the more listens we get. And so again, I'm going to encourage everybody to subscribe on iTunes. But it's also available on, you know, Android platforms like Stitcher, um, FM Player, uh, Google Play, things like that. So please find it. A simple Google search of B and H Photo Podcast. It will come it up, and we'll, we'll, it'll come up, and you'll find it. Uh, and also a consistency when we publish. I think that's really important. We put out an episode every week. So, you know, it takes a lot of work. And it's, and, and it's really important that it, we put it out at the same time, when possible, every week. And iTunes ranking is something to consider because we're always, iTunes is kind of the king, you know, they, they control. And not too long ago, they put us in a little featured segment and our numbers shot up. I mean, we were all already, you know, we were in the top 20 of, of, in the arts <coughs> category because of that. And uh, so doing what iTunes, and we're still trying to learn, you know, what iTunes wants uh, in order to keep us, uh, uh, you know, up top and, and, and get, get better numbers. Here's just a few of the guests that we've had. Uh, we've had, again, 80 episodes with in some, probably over 120 guests because we sometimes we have two, two photographers. But here's just a handful that I pulled out. This is John H. White, a Pulitzer Prize photographer, uh, who we interviewed up at the Eddie Adams Workshop. It was a great episode. Uh, here we have Gail Buckland, who did a great show on sports photography at the Brooklyn Museum and is an author about photography. And, and with, with her and Alan is Andy Bernstein, who's the photographer of the Los Angeles Lakers, the Los Angeles Kings. This is one of my favorite episodes. Gus Powell is the tall man who's a street photographer, and Amy Touchette, also a street and art photographer. We had a great episode called, uh, what was it called? Collaborating with Chance. Basically, what, what do photographers owe to luck? And, and, and how can you turn luck into a skill? This was on the selfie, and we had photographer Nikki Wanzi and author Stephen Mays talking about the difference between a selfie and a self-portrait. Uh, this is an episode on camera collecting uh, with Nigel Russell from uh, uh, Heritage Auction House and Gay Biederman. This is on dance photography. We had Lois Greenfield, a wonderful, wonderful photographer, and Omar Robles, also a great dance photographer. This is Michael Cunningham, the NYPD officer who is a uh, crime scene photographer. And these are two of our, our staffers that we have on a lot. Uh, Levy Tannenbaum in the middle and Andrea Ortada. And, and we were talking about um, uh, what, what was your one camera if you could only have one camera. Mm. And now I'm going to pass it to Jason, who's our producer and audio engineer. Hi. Um, while I, I do help with some of the other functions um, that John talked about, the audio production is my main uh, my name, my main responsibility on the show. Um, I'm not a, I, I am a photographer now. Um, I'm sort of an amateur. Um, not we, we beat it into. Yeah. Them. <laughs> uh, these guys are old pros. Um, audio is my background. So that's, that's what I bring to the show. Um, you can go to the, the first slide. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how you can get great results at home. Uh, you don't need, uh, you know, a pro studio to get really great results. You can, uh, there's a lot you can do at home that can really improve uh, audio quality and, and the quality of your show, you know, uh, altogether. And, and I'll, I'll go over some of the ways you can do that. Uh, one of the first and m most important um, things is to find the acoustic environment in your home that is the, the closest uh, to what you'd find in a pro studio. Um, and I'll go over exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, we'll go over some basic recording and mixing techniques, and we'll also go over... Uh, the gear and software that you need to, to make all that happen. So uh, here we go. Um, this is just a, a basic uh, RLX um, soundboard. And what you can do with this, um, this is great if you've got a, a one or two person um, show. You can go to the next slide. Um, what that does is sit right in front on your desk and, and, and kind of blocks a lot of the reflection that's coming off of, um, off of the wall in front of you. Uh, and that, that uh, for a one or two person show, I mean, for, you know, I think it's, and I think it costs a hundred bucks or something like that. And that, that's a great, that's a, that's a great piece, uh, for, for that, uh, for podcasts, you want to take control. So the, the, for, you know, you, you want to go for a tight vocal sound. You don't want an ambient roomy sound for a podcast. Um, you, you know, if you, a lot of reverb is, is kind of taxing on the ears and if, you know, a lot of people are listening in headphones, I, I, a tight non-reflective sound is, is generally what you want to go for. Some people might, you know, disagree and there's certain situations when, when that may, that may not be true, but I, that's, um, that's generally what you want to go for. Um, and I'll, I'll go over how to do that. 
Um, so you want to find a quiet, non-reverberant space, um, preferably carpeted. Uh, soft furniture is good. Um, and you want to go to the next slide. And you, you want to avoid reflective surfaces. So you, you kind of want to be in the middle of the room. Um, don't don't record near a window. It's just gonna your voice is just gonna you know bounce off that, and and it's gonna get to the mic uh, at a later time than the sound that's coming out of your mouth, and that just it doesn't sound good. Um, and you'll have to fix it in post, and it's you want to avoid that. Uh, for acoustic treatment, uh, some basic acoustic treatment will will take your, your studio to the next level. I mean, you, you can find a great room with soft furniture in your house with carpeting, but, um, you know, there's still going to be walls that are, that are left untreated. And if you really want to get that tight studio sound, then, uh, some acoustic treatment will really, really help with that. Uh, that RLX that this is uh, for one or two, uh, person shows that are in really, really tight quarters uh, that, that RLS Dex, uh, Desmax, uh, stand mounted acoustic panel. That's a, that's a good piece. And if you want to go to the, uh, if you, and if you're recording three or four people, there's a, a 36 piece RLX, uh, ruminator kit. Um, and you can, this is all on the B and H site that you can check out that comes with just a bunch of stuff. And that, that's, that's a really good kit and you can kind of, um, you don't have to use all of it. Um, but you can, you can kind of dampen your room a lot and, and get a much tighter sound. And I think that's a really good kit to use. Okay. Uh, and, and this is the that's the SM7B microphone. I'm going to talk about microphones now. That's a classic vocal mic. Um, it's also a great mic for singing too. Uh, that, I believe that's the mic that uh, Michael Jackson used on Beat It. Um, so just a, just as a side note, but also Robin Quivers has made that mic kind of uh, a staple in the broadcasting world. She she uses that, and it's just used all over the place. It's a great mic. Um, it's got a cardioid pattern for tight pickup, and that's what you want. Uh, whatever mic you get, just make sure it's got a cardioid uh, pattern because what that does is reject sound from the back and, uh, and, and, and the sides. So, you know, if you're recording in close quarters, like, like these are cardioid mics. So, you know, th th we've got rejection coming from here. So very little of my voice is being picked up in this mic. And, you know, it's, it's being picked up just dead on uh, into this mic. And that's what you want for multi-track recording. Um, a USB mic uh, for again for a one or two person show. That, that's a simple solution. Um, there's some good ones. The um, the Rode Podcaster is a really good one because it's actually the same mic as the Rode Procaster, which is the mic that we use for the podcast. That that I fully endorse. It's a great mic. The Blue Snowball is a, is a good mic. It's it's um, inexpensive. I mean, you know, Blue is a great company. They make much better uh, higher end mics than that. But that's a, it's a really good. You know, it's you know a solid mic that's it's inexpensive and you know it's probably the most popular USB mic of all time. Uh, I, I I'm pretty sure it's under a hundred bucks, but it, that's that's a great place to start. So those are uh, those are some good cost effective solutions if you've got a small show. If you're gonna do uh, three four um, guests or more, then a traditional setup using uh, regular old mics and a separate interface with mic preamp is is the way to go. Uh, so some traditional um, broadcast mics that, that people love are um, the Shure SM7B. That Sh Shure is actually spelled wrong up there for some reason. It's a Shure. I'm sure that's a spelling correct, a spell correction thing or whatever. SM7B by Shure is a great mic. The Electro Voice. Blame Alan. Uh, yeah, that was Alan's fault. Um, the, elec <laughs> the Electro Voice uh, RE20 is a great mic. Um, also a great mic for, for bass guitar, just uh, as a side note. Not that you guys care about that, uh, and the Rode Procaster is is uh, definitely a great mic, and you know it's not as well known as the other two. It's a newer mic, but I love that mic, and, and I think it gets a great sound, and, and that's what we use on the on the show. Um, yeah. Just to throw in, and and you can answer this better, but it's super durable. I mean, we've had that thing for two years now. We've brought it all over. We've thrown it in our cases, and totally, it, and they're all all. all all the original ones are still working. Yeah, it's it's a workhorse. It's it's a good mic. Uh, full endorsement for the uh, Rode Procaster. Um, the broadcast arms and and cabling. Uh, you know these are these are nice little stands here. You know th these will work for for stuff like this. These are good. You know for for this kind of thing for a long conversation where people are, need to be facing each other. I think a broadcast arm works a little better because you can kind of pivot around it and move it around, and it just works a little better than uh, than having a static uh, setup like this. 
Uh, so I, I suggest Broadcast Arms. We make uh, RA as an in-house brand that makes a, a, a nice broadcast arm. We actually use those on the show. Um, and then and then cabling. Uh, you know, there's microphone cables are important. Uh, Mogami makes some great cables that are. Uh, uh, that are very well insulated and and you know very low noise and and y- with with gold connections and, and those are very nice but y- you don't need Mogami um, for 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 every case um, RA uh, I'm sorry Sinal actually um, th- their cables that we make are are, are very nice and, and and there's plenty of uh, you know broadcast quality cables out there that, that you can buy you don't need the best cables out there. Um, Audio interface and uh, for podcasting, that is. Music's a little bit more critical, uh, just just as a side note. Um, audio interface and mic preamp. Um, this is the Presonus Studio Live. Uh, it's uh, this is an eight channel um, for microphone uh, preamps, and it's it's got some other channels that you can use for for some other things if you if you want to hook them up. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, well, that's about three, three to four hundred dollars, and if if you're recording three or four people, I think that's a really solid uh, piece to to go for. Also, the Focusrite Scarlet um, uh, I eight one eight, that's that's a really nice uh, piece, and that they ha- it has great preamps that are really clean. Um, yeah, the Focusrite, I, both of those pieces, I think I think are very nice, and and they'll only put you back about three to four hundred dollars. Uh, like I said, they allow you to record one to four speakers at a time. And you could also mix in other equipment because uh, like uh, John was talking about, you might want to take Skype calls and to do that, you need another computer. Uh, so, you know, you can either run, I like to run another sound interface just because it sounds better out of that computer and, and run it into a, uh, you know, run cabling into the interface, but you can run directly out of a headphone jack if you want to. It doesn't sound as quite, quite as good. But uh, that that is one way to do it. Um, so if you're going to do that, then you need uh, you need more inputs. So you know an eight, an eight input uh, interface is 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 appropriate if you're going to re- you know you want to record up to to four guests and you also want to take Skype calls. You can also use an MP3 player if you want to mix in music. A lot of people like to do it that way, or you could do that in post in your DAW. But I'll get to that in a minute. Let me just jump in for a yeah. second. We're, we're talking about skyping, and one of the things that we found is that. Um, I guess depending on your signal and the system you're using, when we do a Skype interview, we'll have the video on early just to say hello and get to introduce ourselves. But we turned the video off because we found a few times that we were losing signals because it was just too much data going back and forth. So after we say hi, we kill the video, and then your audio is strong. I think that's worth. That's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Again, it's a podcast. It's a much. It's a much more. Uh, it's a much sta- more stable signal if it's audio only on Skype. So yeah, say hello uh, with the video, then have have your guest kill his video or her video, and 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 you, and you should do the same, and it'll be a much uh, much cleaner connection. Um, also, there's some telephone, some relatively inexpensive telephone interfaces out there. So if you want to take uh, you know calls from landlines, you can do that too. The uh, JK Audio makes a good one. That's uh, that's pretty pretty inexpensive. Um, headphone amps are, are another consideration. Uh, your guests generally, you'll want to, to have headphones on. A lot of these uh, broadcast mics are, are they're dynamic microphones. Oh, that's the other. All those mics are dynamic mics, and, and uh, that I, that I mentioned. And although the, the the blue snowball is actually a condenser mic, my preference, strong preference uh, for this kind of thing is to use a dynamic microphone, uh, cardioid, uh, as I said, polar pattern. So, uh, no, go, go back. Yep. Um, and that being said, they're not that sensitive. Uh, you know, they, I'm on, uh, I'm, you know, when you're on target with it like this, uh, you know, it picks, it, it'll pick you up pretty good. But as soon as you start doing this, the sound drops dramatically. So I like to have, even though they're all in the same room without isolation, I like to have all the guests wear, wear headphones because if you don't, they're all over the place, and and that makes that makes my job a lot harder when I'm editing if they're if they're not staying in the same proximity and you know as as the microphone. So, uh, headphone amp, uh, you'll need the that. Well, I haven't gotten to the uh, yeah, uh, Behringer uh, HA four hundred. That's a uh, that's a, a nice inexpensive uh, vocal uh, uh, headphone amp, and the HA eight thousand is another eight channel one. That uh, you know, if if you're having more than four guests, that's that's a good one too. So you'll need that to go along with your interface because most interfaces only have one or two headphone outs. I know that was kind of long and long-winded over headphones, but 
Yeah, sorry. <laughs> by, by the way, I do find the headphones to be very valuable because you do move around a little bit, and if you do drift from the mic, you hear yourself drifting off, and you also hear other people. So it helps keep everybody on, on target uh, and, and makes their job a lot easier when it comes to the editing because that could be a nightmare. So I do recommend uh, the headphones strongly. And from a production perspective, there, there's a vibe, I think. I think people feel a little bit more connected when they, when they can hear, yeah. uh, hear their, everyone's uh, voice up, up close and personal. So I think, I think it helps with that too. Um, and monitoring, um, so we just talked about headphone amps. Uh, well, I don't I think our, we got a little messed up there. Okay, so for headphones, the SMH 1000 is an in-house brand, and that's a really nice, uh, inexpensive headphone that is great for stuff like this. Uh, we use them all the time, and uh, th that's that's our main headphone for mixing. Most mixing you, uh, for podcasts you can do in, in headphones. You're not really, you know, some engineers will tell you you shouldn't do that, and and it is better to 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 mix on on speakers on studio monitors. But for podcasting, uh, I think generally um, headphones are okay. I I like the Audio Technica ATH M50. Uh, that's a great headphone. I'm just saying we also don't have that studio space to edit and, and editing. We, oh yeah, we're, yeah. We're well, editing we did, well, in, a, right. in a row with everyone right. working around us. So well, know, I could make us think <laughs> about it and get it and get speaker. <laughs> that's oh, true. It, please, but. Please. Um, <laughs> But uh, for generally for podcasting, uh, you can get by mixing on headphones, and I, I think most podcasts out there are probably mixed on headphones. But if you're doing music, I think that that that, that changes substantially. I, I I don't recommend mixing mixing music on on headphones. It's a little bit more critical in terms of having to recognize frequencies and and spatial uh, <clears throat> uh, spatial positioning, etc. So, uh, but for for podcasting, I think. You don't really need studio monitors. You can go to the next. But um, yeah, so uh, there you go. Uh, digital audio workstation. Uh, that's something you're going to need. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, there's some. There's a free one, Audacity, that a lot of people use for podcasting at home, uh, which is perfectly fine. And there, you can do most uh, most audio tasks in Audacity. Maybe it's not as smooth and as as uh, you know, streamlined as some other programs, but it but it's pretty good. Uh, GarageBand is a, if you have a Macintosh, you have GarageBand, so that's a great place to start. Uh, it's it's basically like a, like Logic Lite if if you guys are familiar with uh, or have heard of Apple Logic. Um, it's closely related to GarageBand, uh, but um, yeah, there, there's a whole lot you can do with that program as well, and most people have it that have a Mac. Audition is a, an Adobe program that's very good. A lot of people use that for for podcasting. Logic is um, is another one. Uh, that's that's Apple Logic. It's kind of the uh, the graduated version of GarageBand, uh, and it's ex an extremely powerful program that you know you can do tons uh, of audio tasks well above and beyond podcasting with that program. Uh, Cubase is another one, and Pro Tools. That says Pro Tools um, <laughs> there for some reason, but uh, Pro Tools is that's my. It was the, originally said Trolls. I yeah, corrected yeah. it. Yeah, I think he's put some Easter eggs in there for me. It seems. Um, <laughs> Pro Tools is uh, my DAW of choice. That's what we use. Uh, it's just, you know, it's what I've always used, and it's it's Pro Tools. I think it's the easiest one to use for, for audio editing and, and probably the most uh, versatile and, and fastest. The great thing about Pro Tools is the okay. – uh, what? Oh, he, he might he may say it's not that fast no, or something. No, I was going to say the opposite. <laughs> I mean, I, I, Jason and I edit together, and – but he's the one doing all the actual work while I'm just saying, you know, or cut this, cut that, whatever. And to see the speed with which he works is incredible. I mean, it just, it's just insane. Well, uh, thank you. I, Pro Tools gives you, lays out your, your keyboard shortcuts in a way that, that you can get really kind of uh, natural and, and quick at it. And they all have shortcuts. And I know guys uh, and girls that, that use all of these programs that, 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 you know, you become one with it, and that's that's kind of the idea. You got to learn the shortcut. I'll, I'll go over that later. But learning keyboard shortcuts for this kind of thing is really important. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna you know record uh, for two hours, let's say, and, and you, you can't you can't just give that to the listeners. I mean, that's you know you'll lose people. You, you need to make these things concise, and you, you know you got to keep people's interest. And really editing them tight is important and and editing two hours of audio if you don't know your keyboard shortcuts that could take a week and i, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, i'm not involved in the editing process i've never been invited um <laughs> i'd be joking around too much uh but i do watch when uh, jason and john are editing and i would say it'd be very easy to say that if 
the recording process, the actual recording of the show, set up, recording, and breakdown, is probably 20% of the entire process of what you hear. I would say 80% more time goes into the editing. We could be there for like three hours for the whole show, and they'll be editing for three days to get it out the end of the week. So don't take editing lightly. It's not, it's not a matter of just sticking on at a beginning and an end in a theme song. They really do work it. And, and being in, in, the, in the podcast when it's happening, I, I often listen to the final product and I know it went down, and I know what I'm listening, and I know that it's been massaged, and it's been massaged very, very well. That's well one thing about that is that, you know, my background in photography and film, I feel really lends itself to that aspect of it, in learning, you know, where to pick up something, you know, where something flows in together, whether it be for the narrative or simply for the flow of the conversation, and... Uh, and, and we do the same thing as writers too because we all write mm -hmm. and, and it's editing whether you're composing a photograph uh, a text a letter or a podcast it's editing and it's about figuring out what's not important what is important and what order should it be in and i think another important thing is to not get not own anything be ready to lose something as good as you might be True. if it doesn't fit don't put it in. I cannot tell you how many wonderful jokes never made it on air. <laughs> really good ones. Too. And that's part of the deal. Well, I, I think that a big thing is uh, not having an ego uh, yeah. at all. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, we're, we're, none of us are afraid to, to, to shoot down ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't matter uh, what job, you know, our core responsibility is. You know, we all have free reign to, to make a call. Uh, no matter uh, you know, no matter what the yeah. the subject is, you know, I, I and and that's okay. Yeah. And these guys are fine. We, we, with that. we all have we all have egos, but you know, at the end of the day, this is our show. Yeah. You know, what goes out there is not about me, John, or Jason. It's about us. It's about and it's about the and show. And that's what we want to yeah. do. We want to yeah. have a good thing, and we want to get good feedback because if yeah. it's about us, no one's going to talk to us. Right. Yeah. I mean, you you want people to to enjoy it, and you want you want to offer something that's you know that's entertaining, mm -hmm. um, and educational. So, Stuck, uh, for mixing and mastering, but we kind of got a mixing and metering. Interesting. Did I have, did I do that? Did, did I, is that my exactly. I think it was your assistant, probably. But yeah, my, yeah, it must yeah. be my assistant. Yeah, you you yeah. got to talk to your assistant. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, plugins are, you can, <laughs> plugins are, <laughs> Uh, are uh, programs within the audio. I mean, I don't know how much you, get, you guys might know all this stuff, but uh, uh, I'm going to assume that you don't. Uh, a plugin is a program you open up within uh, another program, in this case a DAW, um, a digital audio workstation, uh, like a compressor or an equalizer or a reverb or, 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 or whatever. Um, and that allows you to process sound um, in a way that you can't with just the, uh, just the, the digital audio workstation itself. So uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of um, great bundles out there that you can get. Uh, the stock DAW plugins are, are usually uh, pretty good for podcasting. You know, you know, a lot of people make do with those, and I think you can get pretty good results, especially with the Pro Tools stock plugins, save maybe uh, noise reduction, which, which I'll go into. Uh, Isotope makes some really good bundles. Nectar's Elements is, is a pretty inexpensive one that comes with some uh, uh, processing that's really nice for vocals. Um, it has compressors and, and EQs and, and some really nice presets. Isotope RX Advanced, that is a great, great bundle, uh, and that's, that's noise reduction. So if you're out in the field and, uh, you know, let's, let's say we were forced to record in, in, you know, in somewhere like this, uh, that, you know, that has a Remember, we actually came here once to test it to see if we yeah. can record in here. Yeah. You know, if you're doing, like, we've got this, uh, this AC uh, problem. Where you know, and and it's not as if there's video. That's one you know you can get by with uh, with something like that in video because you 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 have something to look at. If you if, you know when people are listening to a podcast and it's just audio and they've got their earbuds in and 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 they're just you know they're hearing a sound. They're not there's no there's no visual to kind of offset their attention. Um, it's I think it's really important to not have irritating, annoying uh, background sound. Uh, and it, it really, and it, <laughs> yeah. Just a fast thing. We, yeah. we were doing an episode on uh, uh, wildlife photography or conservation, something like that. Uh, it was conservation and wildlife. And my phone went off, and my phone, uh, my ringtone is crickets. And thank goodness it was crickets. We were talking about environmental photography, and it was just crickets in the background. It worked. We, uh, we left that. That, that, was, that was actually funny, didn't it? It was. We did. I don't know if we I, I think we that did. That was a good one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that was pretty funny. <laughs> but I don't, I don't mean sound like that. I mean like stuff like... Uh, 
like, like an air conditioning, like um, police, like, police cars. You might have a mind. ground home. Like, let's say that there's, a, which yeah. I can go into uh, in a bit. Um, but uh, there, there's ways to get the noise out. Um, and the best way is to not record it in the first place, but sometimes you have no choice, and R RX is a great way to do that. Isotope is Ozone uh, 7 is another great bundle. Um, that's uh, mastering. So I mean, you don't need to be a mastering engineer to do podcasting, but a lot of people, when they start, first get into audio, they, they, they wonder why their recordings are so low in volume, and it's usually because they have an unmastered um, recording. So Isotope Ozone is a great, uh, is a great bundle that, with tons of easy presets that you know you can't go wrong with, so that's a, that's a good one. Uh, avoiding uh, okay, so engineering tips. Um, I'll just go over some basic engineering tips that uh, that I think uh, can help any podcast or any any record vocal recording in general. Um, you want to avoid recording uh, plosive. It says explosive sounds. Plosive sounds. This is like this is funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not supposed to be explosive. Uh, uh, avoid recording plosive you know, sounds. By the way, yeah. spell check was really messing. Yeah. I want you to know that. <laughs> the fact that I got isotope down, because you're getting yeah. isotopes. No, yeah, it's not isotope. isotope. This is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, okay, so uh, you got you want to avoid recording plosive sounds, which is like P's and um, and, and D's sometimes. Um, you, you, a pop screen and having the mic slightly off axis, like this axis, uh, that that helps a lot. Um, it's it, you know it's better to record these things. You can cut them out later, but it's a hassle, and and I do it all the time. But it's it's better to, to just not record them to begin with. Uh, wait, I had didn't I have other ones? These are all out of order. Okay, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Fix over overly sibilant uh, dialogue when DSing. Sometimes, if you get um, a speaker that has, uh, the, it's just some people the way that they say their s's. It really you get a lot of high end um, information in in the yes exactly, uh, and it's and it's grating on the ear. And if you're hearing dialogue and it's just over and over, it, it I mean someone. I, a lot of times people that don't do audio, they don't know, they, they can't tell you, tell you exactly what's wrong, but they know something's wrong. And all they do is shut it off, basically, um, is what I've noticed. So uh, I think that's one of the big ones. It's, it's very annoying to have an overly sibilant um, uh, speaker. So there's an easy, uh, well, not not always so easy, but DSing, a DSer is, is, a, is a type of plugin um, that you can use to to cut that down, and what it does is bring the volume of just those sounds down, just those those high frequency sounds, and it can make it make the audio easier to listen to. So um, uh, editing, I said this before, editing may take a while, so you should learn your keyboard shortcuts. It's I can't stress that enough. That's I mean that's huge. Yeah, so, uh, and high pass your vocals. This is a, a really easy thing that everyone can do. Generally, I'd say that every everyone should be passed at uh, at 100 hertz. So you just cut your your vocals off with a with a high pass filter uh, at 100 hertz. I, I mean, I'm not saying that that's the only EQ you should be doing, but that's a that is a starting point that everyone. I mean, as soon as you do that, you're gonna you're gonna clarify your mix a lot. So uh, that that and here's another tip. Hear buzzing or humming. Um, I mentioned a ground loop before. Use a ground loop isolator. I showed it. There was a picture of one of a, a pretty inexpensive one, um, the Hum X by Ebtech. It's a pretty good one, and it's uh, pretty cheap. You can you can spend a little bit more money and get an even better one. You can you could you can get a direct box and and even uh, you know and help and help that as well. Uh, let's go to the next uh, and use noise reduction. I, I went over. Uh, Isotope RX, it's a great one. Uh, Waves makes good uh, uh, noise reduction, and it, 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 that's very good too. It's a little more expensive, but uh, you don't want to go crazy with the noise reduction. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to go overboard. You can really start making a, a, a recording sound um, s sort of sterile or or uh, robotic. Uh, even you know, you hear a lot of artifacts and, and weirdness. And sometimes, at a lot of podcasts, you do hear that. You know, people have really started getting their want their recordings as low noise as possible. And I, I feel like some of them I hear they sound a little artifacty, and that's 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 bad too. So you want to be conservative with it, but it helps a lot. Don't clip your recordings. Watch your levels. Uh, you know, generally, there's there's no real reason to uh, to to record any hotter than the negative uh, ten to negative six uh, dB uh, on on an individual channel. Um, there, there just I mean, with there just isn't a reason to do it. You don't want to come anywhere near digital clip. Uh, so, you know, in the analog days, they record a little hotter, I think, because, uh, you know, you had a lot of uh, you had a lot of noise to beat in terms of your signal to noise ratio. But these days 
with low noise digital equipment, it really, I, I, you know, anywhere between negative 10, negative six dB and you, you're golden. Uh, Nick. Oh, and I'm done. Oh, that's me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see. Where are we starting off here? Okay. Um, yes. I was, the, I was the last one brought in and, and I was brought in because they, they wanted a certain sound and voice in it and I've got a big mouth and I'm a wise guy and management knows it. said, all right, throw them in here. Let's see how they do. Um, and I, I recently, have a stammer like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I recently listened to the, uh, the first one or two episodes that we did and uh, <laughs> it was pretty bad. I was really kind of too embarrassed to even open my mouth half the time. Um, but I quickly realized that, uh, again, my voice and, and the, what I say and how I say it is really going to be what's driving the show. Um, and it's not always what you say, but how you say it. Um, best way I can give you an example of it is when you're, when you're speaking in a situation like this. What sounds more interesting? Or you set up a rhythm and you set up a tone and you set up a pace and you do that with your voice and that's what I'm doing right now. And I learned to quickly play with my voice and use it as an instrument, which is really what our voices are. Uh, modulate your voice, don't sound like a drone. Play with it. Um, what else we got there? Create a persona that's interesting but true to yourself, be real. Don't try to put on something that's not you unless you're a very good actor or actress. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn. I managed to stay out of a lot of fist fights using my mouth and being a wise guy. I survived. Um, I've taught at college level, so I had to be able, I learned quickly how to hold the interest of people who really did not want to be there because they had better things to do. Um, and as a photographer, that's part of, it's a form of communication. Speaking is a form of communication. And as a writer, I learned about how to clip down words and get information and form it and present it in an interesting way. Introduction, middle, and ending. And try to create a composition out of it. Um, we mentioned this one already, and I start off by going, um. Be aware of ums, likes, you knows, uhs, all of this stuff. It's inevitable, but try to listen to yourself. And obviously, these guys cut a lot of this stuff out. And we've all been doing ums and ahs along the way here. It's natural. Try to witness yourself as you're speaking and see you know, how Alan's, it goes. I would never say that Alan does a lot of ums and you knows, but we have had some guests that every sentence they start with an um. Oh, and yeah. the time, and, and I, it drives me nuts. Uh, it's sort of a nervous habit, a yeah, little bit. Don't and blame it's them, but, yeah, but so, yeah. We we spent we've spent hours just cutting out ums from episodes. <laughs> it gets a little crazy after a while, but yeah. But you'll get better at it, though. I I think I've seen both of you guys get a lot better at that. You know, over the course mm -hmm. of doing this, you know, I think the more comfortable that you become the less you rely on those kinds of... And a lot of it has to do with thinking on your feet because that um comes from organizing your thoughts, right. really. That's really what it is. So if you stay in the moment, you're less likely to do that. That, that has a big thing to do with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Never underestimate the value of a pregnant pause. Use a dead air space to emphasize things. Um, I don't always agree with a lot of what he says, but Rush Limbaugh is one of the masters of the pause. He uses them very effectively, and I learned that from him when I used to have time to do I used to drive around a lot, so I'd listen to his show just for the entertainment. But that's one thing I did take away from that, is that sometimes if you want to make a point, be silent. And all of a sudden, huh? what happened to the sound? Then you come back to it. It's a way of holding your audience. It's part of the composition, it's part of the modulating, it's part of the song that you're doing. Uh, do your homework. Uh, John and I ha are, have both earned livings with cameras. Uh, I shot commercially for, for 30 years, you've done a bunch of years yourself. We live photography, we love photography. Uh, Jason has caught the bug and he's actually a very good photographer in, in a relatively short time. I've seen some great stuff come from him. And he's eating it up because he studies, he picks brains, he asks questions. And as much as we all know, we have to make sure that we know what our guest is going to be talking about. And it, and it means going online and doing some homework. And I have to credit John with supplying with a lot of valuable equipment up front, saying, here's what we're doing and I'll go. But if you, if you just go and sit down and start talking and you don't know your subject and you don't know the person who you're talking about, that's, just, that's not going to help you. And it's also not going to be the best for the person who you're having a dialogue with. 
Um, you, you can't fake it with the the kinds of guests that we have on. No, These guys know no, their no, stuff. And no, it's, no. It, if you're it, getting good it, guests on, you better you better you better be prepared. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who are you interviewing? Who are they? What do they do? Uh, learn something about them. There might be some subjects you don't want to touch with them. Um, what makes your guest or their work so special? There are a lot of photographers out there. Um, and as much as I hate to admit it, I'm not the best photographer out there. A lot of photographers better than me. Why are they better? <clears throat> what is it that they do that just catches my eye? Uh, and get into that and use that as a, a, you know, a part of the subject. Part of the, but again, learn your subject, do your homework. Just to cut in here. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of photographers who can talk about a lot of different subjects and oh, works yes. a variety. But if we have a theme, we want to kind of keep them onto that theme as well. You know, because... You know, there's a photographer who can talk about a range of things, but we have a theme for that show, so please, you know, keep it on that point. And also, you know, <laughs> there are very many talented, creative geniuses who cannot really speak very well and communicate very well at all. And sometimes you have to be in the position of sort of almost putting words in their mouths by feeding them the answer and then ask a question and sort of get it back in their words. So you have to be able to be able to draw information out because some people are awesome and some people are less than awesome, but you have to make the show work one way or the other. Um, does your guest current work differ from or appear to be a breakaway from their traditional style or comfort zone? And sometimes that's why we have somebody on. They're doing something that's totally out of character for them. Learn about what they did question why they got into what they're doing there must be a good story if somebody's going to go into a whole new direction there's got to be a good backstory to that go after that find out you know what they have gotten out of it how they've grown from it um listen to your guests it's not about you you ask a question the best thing you can do is listen because that's going to give you your next question and it also could open up things that you may not even be aware of or you might be wrong about uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've been wrong about, I've had misconceptions that have been corrected along the way, luckily before I spewed out my falsehoods. Um, listen for follow-up talking points, but don't interrupt unless you have to. Uh, let your guest finish his or her thought. They might actually answer your next question before you ask it. Uh, take notes for topics you might want to delve into deeper. Now, I have John to do that because he's always jotting down little notes. I used to do that, but I can't read my handwriting, so I stopped. So I'll say, I have a question for you. You know, but John will know what it is, uh, and he'll feed me a question. So we work very care uh, together. By the way, I, I got to say that uh, John broached it earlier. Initially, I was going to be the host. I was going to be the voice, the, the mouth, and everything else. And then I, I actually, with, with my encouragement, John started throwing in his two cents, and I find him totally invaluable to the show. I do not want to carry a show by myself. I think it's very important to have, if possible, a second voice, somebody to bounce things off of, because even as, as intense as I might be and can be about photography and gear, John has his experiences, and, and Jason, too. There are plenty of times you've chimed in, and I welcome that because we're hitting the same topic from a different perspective, and we each of us have the ability to zoom into a detail and then pull back globally to look at that same question for me, from different points of, of view. That's one of the, the, imp the most important aspects of the show, and for me, the, th the idea is one theme, different perspectives, and that yeah. means either from the guests we have, and I've, we've always tried to get at least two guests Sometimes they're, they're together, which is the ideal situation, and then it turns into like a four-way conversation. And sometimes we do one and then the other one afterwards. But the idea is always to kind of get a different, slightly different, or sometimes totally different perspective on the same theme. Yeah. And, and it goes back to being the the show. It goes back to being open <clears throat> to other people's ideas. Absolutely. Uh, There's no one answer. You know, if I'm I'm not on microphone, but I can text these guys questions if I have them, and I do it all the time. And they always respond. I mean, they they they'll they'll always throw it out there because you never know where the conversation is going to go. You recently just screamed yeah. out a question. Yeah. It was like, no, 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 I want. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I got the one, was like, what are we having for lunch? I was I didn't ask <laughs> right, that. right, right. But uh, yeah, right. <laughs> joke, joke, joke. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. What do we got there? There you go. Oh, yeah. Inject a touch of humor now and then, assuming it is appropriate. Uh, look, humor is a great thing to have, all right? Um, my biggest problem is not cracking too many jokes. I had to learn to really, really control myself because I can go off on a, on a drop of a hat and just drop a bunch of wise remarks. And yeah, we can cut it out anyway. And they cut them out anyway, and some real good stuff's going down. We're going to have to do a show one day, but all the stuff they cut out that was just good. Um, what else oh. we got? Chemistry. 
we touched on this already. Unless you're flying solo or you're part of a team, keep that in mind. It's not about you. It's about the team. Be it, if it's one, two, or five, or ten, whatever it is. It's imperative that you click with your teammates. We're very fortunate here that even though we were all kind of thrown into this whole thing and we barely knew each other uh, uh, before all that because we each kind of joined the department within you know, different times in a relatively short space. Uh, but we got to click. We worked together very, very well. And it's an imperative, it was a way that you trust your teammates. Um, I don't question anything they do edit-wise. As I said, I, I find that there were a few times when I thought there was some just, oh, you have to keep that joke in there, or that point. But they dropped, and for valid reasons. And I don't even question it. The show that goes out, that's the show that's supposed to go out, and that's fine. We all put in our share on that whole thing. Um, stay juiced keep the energy level off. Uh, every once in a while we're talking and all of a sudden John will go, nope, stop it, Al, start over, you're falling asleep. Stay juiced. You have to have the energy, no matter caffeine how helps. exhausted you are. Yeah, caffeine helps. Yes, it's very, very good. Um, and uh, by the way, just a fast little thing, you know, John mentioned earlier on that there was, it was very hard to get this off the ground. There was a lot, a lot of reservations from different points of upper management or for all kinds of fears, insecurities, just not knowing and understanding. Um, and we had to go through a lot of testing and a lot of agita to get here. And the funny thing is, as soon as we got the go-ahead, within a couple of weeks, our boss and his boss left. And we were floating. And here we were. We finally got the show off the ground. And we were actually able to take it over. And really... It was the best say, thing that happened. It was the best thing. It was our show all of a sudden. We went, where should we go? Where are we taking it? And we were able to move forward and give it a real nice flavor, form, and taste that when the seats were occupied again. They were already on board. They already knew it. And they said, I'm not going to play with this. Keep doing what you're doing. Let's do it better. We and once in a while, they say, what do you need to make it better? And then once in a while, they'll help us. Once in a while. <laughs> I think that's what, that's what sets um, people doing it at home apart a little bit. And gives, you, have, you have a little bit more freedom. There's an advantage to some extent that you don't have uh, the red tape that, that you'd have at a corporation. Uh, and there have been plenty of, of podcasts that have gotten, you know, that have gotten a lot of interest just out of a bedroom and then got picked up by a network like like Gimlet or or mm -hmm. Panoply yeah, or, or any yeah. of them, right? Yeah. So. Um, I was going to say something about, uh, well, you know, we're, this is still a work in progress. I mean, that, oh, I, I, always yeah. feel, I mean, we're, yeah, we're learning, yeah. experimenting, growing all the time. And, and but but I don't feel like we felt six or eight months ago that this may be the last episode every week because we were getting some some of that feedback. Yeah, there were, there were axes hanging over heads out of everybody. It's fear. And, you, know, you know, what are they, what's anyone else right. thinking about the and, whole thing? You know, we, we, and I, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago with the new uh, marketing head at b and and I, and I said what is what I feel is that our job is to, to push. You know, we may be putting out some topics or some images or some ideas that b and doesn't usually want to cover and I'm going to just keep pushing those out until someone says stop. And, and we've done a couple of shows on, on topics that we they said they're never going to let this fly, and they have. We had to do yeah. some very, very careful, these guys had to do some very careful editing without losing the flavor and the message, and they pulled it off, and those have been very successful shows. You've got to take a risk. Yeah. I mean, and, B, and to B&H's credit, they're growing with, yes. uh, with the content team. And again, content is a small aspect of what B&H does, obviously. And sometimes they're not sure what to do with it, uh, and uh, but I say I, I, a lot of credit, you know, to our, our new boss and, and and the management people who have decided to let us run with this. Okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why don't you give him the old? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>